Good evening and welcome to tonight's program, Books Behind Bars. My name is Ann Lindbergh and I am the branch manager at the Scottsville Library, a branch of JMRL. Thank you for joining us for tonight's discussion about the role that books play in the lives of incarcerated people. Tonight's program and all JMRL programs have been made possible by the incredible and generous support of the Friends of the Library. This evening's program will be recorded for inclusion on the JMRL YouTube channel. So barring any technical difficulties, we hope to have it posted within the next few days. At the end of our program, we will have time for questions. So please type any questions you have for the presenters into the chat box and we will address as many as time permits. Issues of access are always forefront in the minds of librarians. Recognizing the unique situation of incarcerated people's access to books, the American Library Association is currently updating the 1992 library standards for correctional institutions, as many library education and social service practitioners work to address the socioeconomic gaps that often lead to incarceration. What are the challenges and rewards of accessing books in prisons? How does reading in prison differ and how is it the same as reading out of prison? Here to discuss these and other aspects of books in prisons, I'm honored to introduce our panelists for tonight's conversation. Meredith Dickens grew up in Charlottesville, Virginia and returned to the area after college and graduate school in New England. She has experience in several types of libraries, including three years as a prison librarian at the Fluvanna Correctional Center for Women before joining the public library in 2007. She has worked for JMRL as a teen librarian, branch manager, and now as a collection manager for the regional system, buying books and materials and guiding decisions about the circulating collection. She trains other library staff in reader's advisory and in providing access to diverse populations. Welcome, Meredith. Thank Elizabeth you. Gentry is currently the librarian at the Fluvanna Correctional Center for Women, where she has worked since 2018. Prior to her current position, Elizabeth has worked extensively in other libraries in various roles, including at JMRL. From Mother Goose Storytime to Programming for Seniors, as well as Bookmobile Service to now Prison Services, she has a commitment to sharing books with all people everywhere. Welcome, Elizabeth. Julie Hewins is a retired clinical social worker and a longtime resident of Charlottesville. For the past six years, she has been the lead volunteer of the JMRL Friends of the Library Books Behind Bars program, where she coordinates volunteers and makes sure the program runs smoothly. Julie spends hours every week reading letters from people in prisons asking for books, and she describes searching for the right book like a treasure hunt. She is always gratified to learn when one of her recommendations resonates with an incarcerated person. Welcome, Julie. And I wanna point out that Julie has gone above and beyond here because um, we've had storms in Charlottesville and she lost power. So she is joining us by phone. So we very much appreciate her doing that. So Dr. Andrew Kaufman is a professor at UVA. Welcome, Julie, by the way. <laughs> Um, Dr. Andrew Kaufman is a professor at UVA and in 2009 founded the Books Behind Bars educational program, which connects UVA students with incarcerated youth to discuss Russian literature. This experience is transformative for all involved as they discover their shared humanity through grappling with the books they read together. The story of this program is told in the film Seats at the Table, which is available for viewing through Saturday with the link attached to your registration. Professor Kaufman has also recently published a well-received biography of Dostoevsky's wife entitled The Gambler Wife, a true story of love, risk, and the woman who saved Dostoevsky. The Gambler Wife was a finalist for the 2022 Penn America Literary Award for Biography and is being adapted into a feature film. Welcome, Andy. Um, a quick note before we begin that the uh, Friends of the Library Books Behind Bars program and is a different program than the UVA Books Behind Bars program. Um, and we'll be learning about both programs tonight. Um, and thank you all for being here. So, um, so let's get started. So I'm gonna start with you, Elizabeth. And I, I wanted to ask um, if you could just tell us what you do as a prison library, like can, librarian, can like you walk us through a typical day or what, you, what, your, um, what your job entails? Well, a typical day has changed a lot um, since COVID-19. Um, it has been two years since I have had 
patrons in person in my library. Um, and I've been the librarian there for three years. So one year of normalcy and now two years of having to redo my whole how I go about things. Um, before COVID, I would have um, each housing unit sign up for an appointment to come in person to the library. And they really didn't have a, an extensive long period of time. It was kind of almost like come in, get a book and go. So um, I know I've talked to other facilities where they actually stayed in the library for longer periods of time and um, even had more time to sit down and read and look at the newspapers and magazines and things. But the way that our facility operated, it was um, almost kind of like a grab and go kind of program. So they did spend a, a long period of time in there anyway. Um, the folks that did stay in the library for longer periods of time would be students. Um, we have Piedmont, PVCC that comes in and does um, courses with the ladies. And so we had students that would sign up for computer time, uh, research time. And then we also had um, the Darden program. And so the UVA um, students would come in and they would do a, an entrepreneurship type program with um, some of our ladies. And so they those students also could sign up and have computer time. Um, but I spent a good part of my day um, helping those students, doing a lot of research because they cannot get on the internet to do uh, look up journal articles and things like that. So I did a lot of research for folks. Um, but then also reader's advisory, just trying to pretty much operate my library as if it were a public library. So I tried to model that as much as possible because um, I have worked in public libraries quite a bit in the past. So I tried to have that same feel that when they were there, it felt just like they were, you know, mm -hmm. in a public library at home. So, yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Meredith, you also worked as a prison librarian. Would you like to add anything to Elizabeth's description or any? Uh, no, that's great. And it's really interesting to hear because I worked in a vet's library, but it was 15 years ago. So it's the same <laughs> facility, but I think things have changed. The state has changed the way um, they employ librarians and a little bit in the way things were moved around. So uh, in my day, they did have a little bit of time during the day. They, they could come in for a little bit more time, um, sign up for a, a movie, uh, like a TV to watch a movie on. We had VHS yeah. tapes and little, little okay. TVs. So a few lucky ones could come and watch a movie. Um, we had very few computers at that time. It was mostly just for word processing, for typing papers, um, for classes from basic literacy up through college. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a lot of it was recreational reading and, okay. um, and checking out your hometown newspapers. That was very important okay. because we had inmates from across the state. We had newspapers from all across the state. And sometimes it was, you know, it took a while to get there, but um, okay. having that connection to back home was always important. Um, and, and as Beth said, it, it really does. Um, I remember talking to the prison librarians at the youth facilities and they were really school oriented um, in addition to recreational reading but right. the the prison library and the adult facility really is like a little small public library you've got to have leisure reading yeah, and right. um, in addition to supporting the educational and vocational programs um, so just a lot of the bestseller thrillers and romances and regular wow. reading because you know the folks want to be able to to choose to choose something right. to read right mm -hmm. wow um well so julie your your job also entails um getting books to incarcerated people um through the jmrl friends of the library um books behind bars program um can you tell us more about that program and how it works i'd love to thank you ann yes um friends of the library um adopted Books Behind Bars from Kay Allison, a local bookstore owner, about six years ago, and that's when I started working with the program. And um, through this Books Behind Bars program, 
prisoners can write letters and ask for up to three free books per month. And it's totally free for the prisoners. And they, they write letters and they um, tell us what kind of things they want to read. And then our volunteers go through all the books that are donated to the Friends of the Library for their biennial sales. And we can choose um, any books from that, those, those collections to send out to the prisoners. And um, we, we send out about 1,000 books a month to about 30 of the state prison facilities. Right now, we're just sending the state facilities. And all the work is done by volunteers. We're really fortunate to have funding from red light management to pay for postage and supplies and anything like that that we need. Um, so it's uh, we try to send out books to as many prisoners as we can, and they request you know from the gamut from quantum physics and Plato to wow. YA fantasies to um, home repairs to cooking books. Um, we send out tons of journals, um, journals and composition books, puzzle books like word search, and also children's books and coloring books, especially the women want the children's books to share with their children and grandchildren. Oh, wow. Wow, that's amazing that you do a thousand books a month. That's a, that's a lot. Um, yeah, <laughs> it is a lot. It's a lot of books. Um, so it's a, what I'm hearing is that books are, there's a lot, a variety of books and that they all seem to play an important role to the people who are incarcerated. So um, Andy, can you speak a little about your books behind bars program, what it is and um, what impact those books in that program play for the incarcerated youth? Sure. Um, so I want to mention that the, um, uh, the Books Behind Bars program that Kay Allison started has actually been around since the 70s, so um, many, many more years. We actually only came on the scene in 2009, um, and, uh, and I remember going to Kay when we started, you know, gaining traction. Um, I went to Kay, I think it was in 2011, and I said, you know, I started this class at UVA. Uh, it's called Books Behind Bars, Life, Literature, and Leadership is the full title, Life, Literature, and Leadership. Um, and I really don't want to change the name, but um, I will if you want me to, because it's got the same <laughs> name. And Kay was very gracious. And she said, no, that's fine. The more the merrier. Just if you get our uh, grant checks, just make sure you mail them. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just want to give credit. So um, so in some ways, the life literature le and leadership really captures the spirit of what we do, even maybe even more than Books Behind Bars, because this is a, it's a class, it is an actual class at UVA where UVA students get credit, and now um, so do the incarcerated students. Um, oh, cool. They also, it took me seven years to lobby UVA um, to do that. For a long time, it was just a, a kind of volunteer program, but now it is a course in, the, in, in this class um, these two groups of students come together, the Correctional Center students and the UVA students, and they sit down side by side once a week um, in small groups, uh, and they uh, remain, it's, that small group is their group through the whole semester, and every week they discuss a different uh, mm -hmm. work, short work of Russian literature, um, works by famous writers like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Chekhov and Pushkin and, um, and, and others, and so uh, and the idea is, um, you know, this is an opportunity for these two groups of same aged um, pe young people to explore um, life together through literature, through these classic works of literature. And, the, and our focus is really on the big questions that these books raise. Who am I? Why am I here? How should I live? Um, you know, all kind of the kinds of questions that Russian literature really grapples with in a profound way. Um, and so, you know, when I started this in 2010, I had no idea. I mean, I had no idea that we would still be around in 2022, um, which is why I didn't think carefully about the title. I thought it was going to be a one or two. <laughs> uh, so be careful what you wish for. And always have a, make sure you um, think about the title of any program you start from the beginning, assuming it will be around for a long time. Uh, and, you know, we have seen, um, you know, really profound transformations happening on both sides. Um, and this is very much a program of equals. This is not a traditional service learning model where the quote unquote haves 
go in and serve the quote unquote mm -hmm. have nots. Mm -hmm. This is very much a community of equals, a shared inquiry and the learning uh, and, the, and the transformation and the impact happens in both directions. And so um, the correctional center students, um, kind of the biggest transformation is a number of them had never even considered college in their futures. They didn't, never thought of themselves as college material. Um, they never had anyone that went to college in their families or in their peer group. And now all of a sudden they are in a college class and they're sitting down side by side with UVA students reading college level texts, having college level conversations. And so it really empowers them um, to, and to realize that they have this in them. And so mm -hmm. a number of those students, the Correctional Center students have actually, after this you know, one class have actually been inspired to consider college. A number have applied to and have since enrolled in college. Um, so we've got a lot of stories like that. Um, and then on the UVA student side, um, you know, many of them, some of them are interested in juvenile justice, some of them have studied it, but very few of them have actually interacted with people mm -hmm. in the system, mm -hmm. um, let alone formed relationships with them. And so it really gives them a very human perspective on not only who the, this population is, I mean, a number of my students you know, are going on to law school and, and, and but a number of them have, ch have changed their, their career plans, yeah. you know, realizing that, you know, if they're going to law school, that they don't want to be a partner in a corporate law firm. They want to advocate for, you know, um, you know, incarcerated youth, mm -hmm. or even in the one case of the student, UVA student who actually at the end of, was, came into my class thinking she wanted to become a prosecutor and she, she still wanted to become a prosecutor at the end, but she said, you know, that I will never be the same kind of prosecutor that I would have been before I had wow. this experience. Wow. Um, so those are the kind that those are the kinds of impacts that this experience um, has been having. Yeah, that's, that's very powerful. I mean, one of the things that I thought so many things when I watched the documentary seats at the table, but um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that you have people with these different experiences reading a book by somebody who, you know, a Russian author from the 19th century who themselves has a different experience. And yet somehow all those three different experiences, like it can resonate. So um, I, I just, I, I found that very fascinating. And um, yeah, I, I didn't know if anybody wanted to speak to that or that just, it's really fascinating to me. I mean, I think that's what books do. I think I books, think so. Right. Right. I, mean, I think books both help us appreciate the individuality of every person's experience, the diversity of experiences. But at some level, books can also help us recognize our shared humanity and mm -hmm. the things that we have in common. And even though we may have a di different language to describe it, Everyone knows what loss feel like, feels like. Everyone knows what love feels like. Everyone, you know, those universal right. human experiences um, are shared across cultures, um, you know, a, um, among really diverse um, people. And so that's at least from my perspective of my work, that's one of the discoveries that, that mm -hmm. the incarcerated students and the university students mm -hmm. um, make. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. It's it's the books themselves. And also when you can see this in the film is it's the conversations we have about books. Yes. Is that yeah. If I see something about myself or my experience in this book, I might not be able to talk about my personal experience with somebody I'm not very close to, but I can say, here's this other thing and I relate yes. to it and you yeah. relate to it too. And we can find the common ground where we might not be able to quite get there to ourselves, but we can use the book to get there. Mm -hmm. So that's true. Yeah. Do you, I have a question for um, Meredith or uh, well any of you? Because based on what you just said, you know, I actually find that the more removed from the um, immediate experience of the reader a book is, the more the easier it is for them to kind of have conversations and really. To ah. talk about it, it, it's almost like biblio. Um, so the reason Russian literature works is because it is equally foreign to both groups. Yes, and so no yeah, one feels true. like, you know, well, we're talking about yes. me. They don't feel that pressure. And in fact, they are talking about them, but they're doing it through 
you know, the lens of these very different characters from a different century. And I'm just wondering if you guys find that um, as well, or if there's a value in actually having people read uh, books that describe experiences um, that they understand and know today in, you know, 2022. I think both. <laughs> yeah. um, I think I think you hit the nail on the head in the beginning. Is that yes? That having that little bit remove allows me to say, I it's not it's not just me. So I can also say, oh yeah, I feel a little safer saying I I do have, because it's not just me and it doesn't put the pressure of my own you know um, experience. But then there's also a whole lot of power in reading a book that directly relates to something I feel that isn't always represented. So um, one of the things we're, we look for is a broad collection that, that includes a lot of different voices, especially voices that aren't in traditional literature, um, so that a reader can say, oh, I, I, do, I do feel seen now as well. So I think on both ends. Yeah, Meredith, isn't that what we say as librarians? We say the mirrors and windows. So, you know, you're seeing yourself, but you're also being able to see others. Um, but but as somebody who really loves Russian literature, I also think um, just the fact that Russian literature so kind of blatantly raises questions about like, what does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to be, you know, to run after success? What does it mean to, you know, all these kinds of questions that, um, they're just very blatantly kind of ask you to think about them. That does um, seem like it um, allows people from all over anywhere to, to talk about what that means to them. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I heard, I heard um, you, Meredith and Beth talking about um, how some people, so how some incarcerated people read for pleasure, seem to read for pleasure. Others are, you know, reading for. So, did what did you find that you know did did incarcerated people in your experience read for the same reasons that we all read, either to escape or to learn? Okay, absolutely. I mean, um, I think I have I have people that do a little bit of both, um, and I have people that they start off maybe they'll come into the library and they're heading to that same area and that same section and they're reading the same comfortable things and it's kind of hard sometimes to get them to branch out and try another area of the library but when they finally do and and they realize and, and they start to appreciate other genres and things I, I really feel like I've accomplished something too and I can introduce them to other things to read yeah well, are there? I'd like to. Oh, go ahead, Mary. Can I make a comment? Oh, yeah, please, yeah, Julie, go like ahead. Say, yeah, that um, we see the same thing in the books that they request. Um, you know, some people will request things like urban fiction um, always, which is very hard for us to provide for them. But I think they're seeking something that they can relate to that's more like their real life or African American authors, perhaps, or crime, true crime fiction is very popular which sometimes kind of surprises me. But on the other hand, we have people who are collecting Dickens works. We have people who want to read the classics. We have people who ask for the most recent contemporary fiction they can get. I found a book today that I've been searching for for three weeks at someone's request. And I looked inside and it was it just came out in February of 22. And oh, wow. they already were asking for it. And I was really thrilled that I found it and can send it out to them. Um, but they, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me what people, you know, are looking for. And I saw during COVID when many of the prisoners could not go to their libraries because they were on shutdown or in some of the higher security facilities where they tell us, you know, we're, we're shut down most of the time. We can't get to the library. Mm -hmm. They were wanting much more fantasy fiction or sci-fi yeah. and asking just for the thickest, fattest books we could possibly send to last for the month, you know, and um, I, I don't, it's slowed down since, um, since COVID is lifting, the restrictions are lifting a little bit, but I, I thought that was really fascinating, how many you know, just wanted have, to escape and to pass the time. Yeah, yeah, we would have whole groups of ladies that would get together, and because I've, I've been doing a sign up sheet since they haven't been able to come in person, I tried to have in person reopen um, 
I guess about a month ago, three weeks ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I had one group come through and we had an upswing of cases again. And so they shut me down again. I'm hoping on Monday, we're going to try again to reopen. Um, but I've had like a sign up sheet in the housing units where they could sign up for one book and then I pull them and I deliver them. And so a whole group of people would get together and ask for one book in a certain series and then they'd all pull their books together so they could share the series. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. But um, that's great. You know, I love it. It's hard, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's hard for us to have, um, you know, the next James Patterson or the next Jody Bacolt book as it comes out because a lot of times I'm having to wait until it comes out into paperback because I'm trying so hard to be mindful of my monies and I don't tend to be able to buy the hardback book. So I have to wait. So mm -hmm. they usually are getting impatient with me. And that's probably why they're starting to write and request it from you. But we're kind of, you know, there's always a delay in what we are able to get to them. So, well, and often they tell me that um, once they finish reading the book, they will send it to their library. Oh, yeah. And we so, definitely <laughs> benefit from you all as well because they do. They we share love that. Them. Yeah. We do it's love that. that. Yeah. And also um, just trying to keep um, the series up, you know, like I, I can't, if, if you lose one book, like book five in the middle of a series, I can't keep going back always and repurchase that when I'm trying to purchase more current things. So that's where you guys can fill in those holes a lot of times too, for what they're trying to read in a series. Um, and then like you say, they'll end up getting donated to us. So we appreciate it. Is there ever, like, I'm thinking about the power of how, um, a couple of you have touched on this, uh, the, the ability to like talk about a book with other people and talk about how it resonates. Are there other book clubs or an opportunity for people in prisons when they read books to like have a book? Does everyone read the same book at once ever or? We did. Um, we've had um, a book study of Man's Search for Meaning, which that mm -hmm. book is very, very popular. Um, mm -hmm. And then we've had some other things on a smaller scale, but you know, we're still, we're still in um, oh, COVID. COVID mode. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hoping that things like that are going to come back. Yeah. Um, we've tried to do some types of things like that, where we are sending out materials to the wings, but then it, you really just need to be able to get together in person to have your discussions. So right. it's been hard. But. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go on, please. No, please, Annie. Beth mentioned COVID. Um, so we uh, we actually continued our class even through COVID. Um, the uh, Bonaire Juvenile Correctional Center, they um, had technology access. And so we did oh. a whole semester in 2021, the spring of 2021 on Zoom. Oh, and wow. even this even this past semester, even as the UVA students were in person, um, the uh, incarcerated students were still um, on Zoom okay. um, for the reasons that, you know, that Beth just alluded to. Um, but what, what I have found is that um, these conversations, even in a Zoom environment, were even more important or not. They were urgent. They were uh, they provided a kind of solace, a form mm -hmm. of connection. Um, that otherwise wasn't there. And so yeah. I was, my biggest fear is that, oh my gosh, you know, this, this program is going to fall apart because the, the real power is that face-to-face -face interaction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what I discovered is that the real power is the interaction um, yeah. in, in, in any form that yeah. you can get it. And so, yeah. um, and so everyone felt that isolation, but they also recognized the value of this experience of being able to talk about these things, um, you know, these important questions that they're all grappling with with one another um even though you know it wasn't perfect right yeah um well i mean do you have do any of you have any other stories you want to share about about the impact of the book the books you know books in prisons or um experiences you have with um incarcerated people and their um and the books they read well, I know that, 
you know, Meredith and I share this and that we've both been there, but it's, it's definitely been the most appreciative group of people that I've worked with. Um, and I feel like when I go and I deliver the books to the building, it's like I'm Santa Claus showing up with gifts, a bag of presents or something. Um, but it, they're just starved for the information. And when they write to me and I'm trying to research something for them um, or help them read about a diagnosis that they've got medically or you know, a, a family member has gotten a diagnosis. So looking up things like that, um, you know, it, it, helping them, like their child will have a book, a novel that they're reading and they'll want a copy of that children's book oh. because they want to be able to read that book over the phone or they have video chat, video visits, and they'll want to read that book along with their child, those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, it just... There's, it's just very, very rewarding. It's, it's been the best job I've had. So, wow. um, yeah, I, I see just, you know, and until some, you just don't appreciate and they really appreciate and are starved to have the information. So it's, it's very rewarding. And I'd like to share, if I may, um, just one of, of course, one, one of thousands of letters we've gotten, but one um, that caught my attention, um, I was, it's just a few, uh, it's just one paragraph, but this uh, gentleman wrote um, saying, thank you very much for the books I received in August. It is so nice to have something to read on a regular basis. This is a high security prison, so we stay locked down most of the time, and reading really helps me keep me going each day. I started first grade at Clark Elementary in 1956, and the school system had just implemented a new reading program. And I was hooked on books at an early age and read everything I could get my hands on at the school, at the school library. And then the public library, which had a kids section at the time. Even as an adult, I've always had a library card wherever I've lived. Um, and then he goes on to ask for a couple more books. But um, wow. those are the kinds wow. of letters, you know, that um, we just get all the time. And uh, speak, you know, saying yes, it's like Christmas when the books come, and how excited everyone is. And um, another person says, "Thank you so much for the concordance you sent me. The size and quality of that book was more than I ever hoped for, and I'm so thankful for it. I use it all the time to find scriptures and to find the original Hebrew and Greek meanings to words." Um, reference books are extremely popular, um, especially among the men. We send, send out over 100 dictionaries a year um, to, to those who request them. Um, I think they like to have their own dictionary, their own reference book. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, uh, it, the, the gratefulness is, is there. And I think um, especially so many that write to us are, are indigent and don't have family and friends or, or the money to order their own books. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it's, it's a great resource and um, we'd like to send out books to even more people. Wow. No, one thing, um, you know, when I worked in public libraries, the, re the reference section was kind of dwindling and you started weeding it down because you didn't need a lot of those resources anymore because you could find so many things online. And now I look at my reference section and I'm like, oh my gosh, that is a definitely an area that I've got to work on. Um, when I worked for Pamunkey Regional Library, I was at a really small branch. And so we didn't get the latest and newest of a reference material. And so when they would maybe buy it for a larger branch, then we would rotate. And so I would get, you know, maybe it was 2015 and I would get the 2014 as the person got the 2015. And I would like to get in touch with the public libraries to see if I could some kind of way get on a rotation like that. Because when, when we have That's is good. 2009 or 2010, yeah. 
of something. Yeah. We get in really touch with me, Beth. Yeah, uh, that's a good off the call. We can, <laughs> yeah. what we can do. I had somebody ask me for the writer's market um, and I just sent it. I was embarrassed to send it to them because it was the 2009 writer's market, but I still sent it, but it was so out of date. It was terrible, but yeah. Thank you for sharing those stories. And one, one thing I, I hear all of you saying, and that to me really came through also in the Seats at the Table movie was just the sense that when, when you imagine, so you can imagine if you've never met an incarcerated person as somebody other, like, um, but if you think of a person reading the same book that you might like, there's automatically a connection there. Like when I hear, you know, Julie, when you were telling, you know, reading that letter, I thought, wow, this person, you know, loves to read and, and I love to read. And that's just, it, I don't know, it almost seems like everybody should know that incarcerated people like to, I don't know, there's something about it that really feels like um, it breaks down those barriers or something. Well, one thing for me, um, you know, I, I can't sit and chat with the ladies about my children or my family and things like that, but we can sit and talk about a book all day long. And so it gives us a topic that we can discuss and share something, you know, because most of the time we can't discuss other things like that. So it, it is very nice to be able to connect over something and yeah. as a book. Yeah. Well, and yeah, and one one of the things, um, you know, I don't know if you remember in the in the film, but on the very last day of the celebration and the speeches, and one of the one of the young men said something that really was echoed, you know, has been echoed over the years. So a lot of the um, correctional center students, they were expecting the university students to come in and look down on them mm -hmm. and treat mm -hmm. them as less than. They were. Mm -hmm. You know, and they also had their own stereotypes about, you know, the snobby, you know, the privileged UVA students. Yeah. And, and so both groups kind of um, see beneath all those stereotypes and they see the humanity in one another. And, and this young this young man said, you know, you came in here and we, you treated us like people. And for, you know, and we hear over and over again for an hour and a half a week, I felt like a human being, not a prisoner. Um, and that was a huge gift that they received because they are so used to being looked at, frankly, even in the system itself, um, by people who have power over them. They're so used to be being looked at through that lens of the hierarchy of, you know, either not having power or being judged or whatever. And these young people, their same age from a university come in and don't judge them and, and form a relationship and treat them as human. That that's a significant that's a that's a major gift that mm -hmm. um frankly that we can all give one another. It's I mean yeah, what I saw yeah. happening there, I I when I think about, you know, when I think about my class, I think, wow, wouldn't it be incredible if all of us today, yes. you know, in these times had the ability to look one another in the eye and see a fellow human being first and yes. foremost, yes. you know, not a political foe or an ideological yes. foe. So that is that's just a human skill that all of us need work at. Now that's that's interesting you say that because one of the things I said um, to my husband after we watched the movie, I said, what if the whole country had the same book they had to read? Like what if we could all share and time we would find that we have things in common? So yeah, that's that is quite the gift. And I also thought the um I thought one of the students was really brave and honest when he was looking back on his experience and he said um you know when I started out he was he was honest to just admit this when I when I started I was wondering like I wonder what these people did and then he said after after I didn't care like after I got to know them I didn't care like I just got to know them as people and wanted to talk about the books and so and um yeah I think I think just seeing people as not labels I mean hopefully that's what books and libraries and your program um, can do. Um, 
Well, I would, another thing I was wondering about was um, access to books in prison. So I just read a news story that, um, I don't know if all of you saw this, but that a Pulitzer Prize winning history of the Attica prison uprising um, has been banned in New York prisons. And the author is actually suing the state of New York because she believes her book should be allowed in prison. So um, to the extent that you feel comfortable doing so, I was wondering if any of you could speak to the larger issue of access in prisons um, and the challenges um, of that. Um, but I mean, Beth might be a better right now because I can speak to what it was, you know, when I was there. Um, it was something that, you know, as as a librarian, and I'm gonna. Um, I just realized that my room was getting darker and darker, but now I can't turn the light on. So sorry about that. Um, <laughs> hopefully, you can still see the face. Uh, it was something that, you know, as a librarian, our our vocation is to give information and give books to people. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that I continuously heard um, at, um, Beth was talking about the most great, you know, the, the gratefulness that you saw is that everyone who came in said, you know, Ms. Dickens, this is the only place where we can just come get stuff. And, you know, you just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, give us, give us the books and, you know, they have to come bring them back. But, uh, but it was, uh, it was just, yes, that's, that's our drive is to say, here's, here's all the books. Um, but then it's working in the prison system, you have a very specific, the Department of Corrections has a list of books. And if any book for any reason comes to their attention as um, dangerous to their mission or dangerous to security for a, a baffling, to, to my mind as a young librarian, it was a baffling array of reasons. Um, there could be just one line in an entire novel um, that somebody hit on um and then the across the state that book could not be in any institution um and it it's a it's a a, a really intense version of what happens in the outside world too is where a, a knee-jerk emotional reaction happens to a specific book because of one thing that people might not might not enjoy or appreciate, but they don't see the entire context of how the book can enrich someone's life, or they don't understand how it might not enrich their life, but it will enrich somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, it, it is it was very hard as a librarian um, to have a list of books that I had to remove from my library. Oh. And in the correctional situation, there's no there's no recourse for that. Um, so so is that, but there was, there, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if Beth can talk about any more current situations. So yes, there's the disapproved list. Um, there's a committee that of course sits and reads and makes the decisions and there's no librarian on the committee and that, that bothers me a little bit. Um, but some recent things, some um, uh, Ken Follett books have made the list. Um, John Grisham is on the list um, just because there's a title called The Escape. And I think that's all it is, is the title is The Escape. Um, there's been some of the Game of Thrones, the George Martin series, some of those have appeared on the list. And it just ruins it because it's like a couple of books. Sometimes it's the first book in a series, um, but yeah, it, you know, it's very hard when you're a librarian and you've been trained and taught and believed not to censor books and then you see so many and, and especially the, um, the urban books. I, I have a hard time finding things that I can have. I'll, I'll spend the money and literally like a month after I've purchased some, something, it's made it onto the list, so it's hard. And have you ever raised this issue with your superiors? Do you, are you able to do that? Um, I, listen? Yeah, I, I can, um, like you can have the, the committee go back and you can challenge their decisions and have them sit through and try. They have a few times they have reversed it and taken things off the list. Um, but I don't know, I think it's been very hard <laughs> to um, have that happen. 
I, I really, I, I really think I'm kind of walking a fine line of what I'm talking about. Yeah, here. no, don't, don't, <laughs> so, you, don't um, you don't have to say it if you don't feel comfortable. Yeah, I would be interested to see mind at side and security <laughs> trumps everything. And so I don't know. I'd be interested to hear from Julie about how their yeah. program works yeah. with the, um, the disapproved list. And also, you know, do you have an access to that list or do you, what do you have? What strictures do you have and what you can send to an individual prisoner uh, inmates? So when she when she sent if she sends it in, um, I don't know if Julie has access to the list, but if she sends it in, those materials are scanned and gone through over at the warehouse before they'll make it into the facility. So there's still a second line of check where they're checking those books to the list. Right. And yeah, I so do know the yeah. mailroom has that list, but I just didn't right. know if if the books behind the bars program, what you take into consideration when you send stuff in? Well, that, that's a really good question. That was the biggest challenge I could imagine, I could think of is that, every, and it seems like every prison has their own way of dealing with this. Some are more strict and some are less strict. I have seen a list, it's been a couple of years ago, um, I'm sure it changes all the time. And, you know, we decided that um, we would send what the prisoners ask for. And if on the receiving end, their property department did not allow them to have it, then that was okay. That, that's what happens. We can't control that. But we, we do know, I mean, there are a few things that we know are pretty standard across the board and we try to abide by the rules as best that we know them, but we never get any feedback from the prisons about what they do or don't want us to do. Um, or very rarely, I should say. Every now and then something comes back and says that they can't have this. But um, for example, uh, uh, they frequently ask for, the, the inmates frequently want drawing books or how to sketch or how to draw. That's a very popular pastime. And whenever I send an art book, I go through and I cut out the pages of any nudes because I know that that's not allowed. <laughs> And then I send the book on, you know, because there's lots of other good stuff in there. Um, we know that, you know, we don't send out books that are, I, I mean, any modern fiction has, a, these days, has violence in them and other kinds of things. And um, it would be almost impossible for us to know which ones are allowed and which aren't at any given prison. Wow. But we don't. I expect, we expect the prisoners to give us feedback of, oh, I didn't receive any books or, you know, they told me I couldn't have that. And, um, and to, or maybe to not ask for what is not allowed, but uh, we just keep sending it. And if they send it back, okay, well, we'll, we'll we learn something. And if they don't send it back, um, okay, too. Um, the one, one thing that's hard about this is um, from what we have understood um, we are not to send books in foreign languages unless there's a side-by-side -side English translation. And this is really hard for um, the Spanish-speaking population um, who often want books in Spanish. And we have books in Spanish, but it's really rare to find a book with a side-by-side -side translation, even a Bible or something. Yeah, and I don't... I guess I, that's hard to, for me to understand. Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be side by side, but if I have a copy of it written completely in Spanish, I have to have a copy of it also written in English. So a Bible in Spanish might be okay then if there's a, a Bible in English to go with yes, it. It should be, um, it should be. <laughs> yeah, that's been a little tricky for us, but we, we do, um, you know, that's a, that's a frequent re request. Um, and um something we'd like to be able to, a need we'd like to be able to meet. Well, well uh, one, of the, one of our attendees has asked a question, um, and this is how they've, they've formed it. They said, who serves on the censorship committee and how are they selected? So how are, how are those? I mean, we know, Meredith is the person who handles all of this at Jamarell, and, and Jamarell has a great request for reconsideration. So if somebody wants a book that they don't like, there's a whole process that we go through. Um, and it's the default is obviously everything should be on the shelves. There should be Act, you know, equal access, access to everything. Uh, obviously, that's not the case for incarcerated people. So, how is it just each prison does their own thing, or how does that? So the the committee, um, I think, is mostly formed of people 
at headquarters. I don't know that they have people from individual facilities on it. Um, but to be honest, I, I just know there's no librarians on the committee, but um, right. I'm not sure How what they positions they hold, the people that are on the committee. Yeah, um, our headquarters is called Atmore, and um, I'm sure probably it's mostly folks there that are on that committee. If and I remember and correctly, it was the Department of Corrections because they view it as a security issue rather than an information issue. So it's really, they're they're concerned about the security aspects of what's in the books. Um, so they're the security experts. Yeah. Uh, somebody else has asked, uh, has said there was a story in NPR that Michigan prisons are banning Spanish and Swahili dictionaries. Um, and is this something you anticipate that other states will follow? I guess it just kind of depends. You must get some sort of notice about what's being banned or whatever. Um, so some sorts, they, they do not allow things written in code. Um, and there are some languages and things. There's a list of what languages are allowed, but I know for most of the books, I can have it written in another language if I also have it written in English. So I don't know of like an entire language being mm -hmm. banned per se. So. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think what the way it was explained to me was it's not the language itself. It's just that we don't, they typically don't know what it says. So yes. it's the, the ignorance mm -hmm. of the officers who can't see what's in there that they so that, that's why they need the translation to say okay this is fine okay um so it's nothing about the language specifically the pilgrim's progress is on the list and i've been trying and trying to figure out why that's on the list and the only thing i can think of is at one time it, and maybe it's banned because it was the old english version of the pilgrim's progress i don't know but it's just sometimes things on there that i can't for the life of me figure out why it's there but it does sound it's it did seem capricious sometimes where it was like one thing by an author but another thing by the same author was fine um yeah you can't and it's not like i can just remove that page i have to if the materials become disapproved for just one line on one page i wish i could just mark that line out or take that page out but that's not allowed either I have to remove the entire work so you guys, I want to ask you a question. So we see this happening at the national level, um, although in a different way uh, for ideological reasons and political reasons, books being banned. Is there any of that going on or is it truly that a group of people who you know consider themselves experts in security issues feel like they make the final security call? Uh, or is there also, you know, political reasons or ideological reasons. You may not be able to speak to that publicly. I don't know, but. I certainly can't speak to it now because again, I am a decade and a half removed from the folks making the decisions. Hmm. Okay, well, you can take the fifth on that. <laughs> I don't know about Beth. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I do feel like there are certain representations that I think I see more of their materials banned than others. And I'll just say that, but right. yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it, yeah. I mean, Andy, that's a really good point because, well, first of all, I'm kind of surprised they haven't banned the Russian, <laughs> the Russian literature that you're. Uh, they <laughs> have just not in prisons. Yeah. But there, <laughs> in, no, in, but there, there was a, Russian culture is being canceled in all sorts of different ways, including Russian literature. Um, and uh, a friend of mine wrote a really, well, I mean, I've been talking about that, which it's it's completely ironic because the Russian writers were the ones who were themselves imprisoned for their opposition yes, to the yeah. government. They were yeah. the ones who spoke truth to power. Um, but this is a great example of what happens, just the frenzy that happens. Like, you know, people are, you know, because of what Russia, because of what Putin's doing now, anything Russian is tainted. And yeah. um, it's just these knee jerk reactions happen in so many aspects of life. Um, but things are more subtle than that. They're more complicated, right. yeah. in including in prison. So one of the thoughts that I wanted to share is what I have found is that 
um, before we started working at the Correctional Center, a number of the staff and people in positions of power had really fixed ideas about who these incarcerated youth were, you know, because they had experienced them in a certain context. Mm -hmm. um, and so they had ideas about what, you know, what they were capable of or what, what they were like. And one of the things that our program has done is it's actually shown a different side of who these, you know, young men are, a different side to the very people who have worked with them for years. And it's opened the staff's eyes to realize like, wow, so-and-so is much, you know, he's really engaged. He's got some deep thoughts. I never knew that. Or, you know, so they see, um, and I guess the reason it relates to the banning issue is because I think a, a mistake that a lot of us make is that we assume, you know, it's okay. So you're a security expert. Okay, that's fine. But I also think you assume that you understand someone. You understand what's going to happen if somebody, you know, engages with a particular book, which, you know, presupposes that you understand that person. And there's so much about people that we don't understand. And if we were, if we, if we take a few more risks, we may discover, you know, very be very pleasantly surprised by what we find out that actually they were going to not let us read certain Russian works. And they did take a risk early on. And they were glad that they didn't ban them because they Good. found that the very works that they were most concerned about actually um, were incredibly eye-opening and valuable yeah. for the youth who were reading them. Um, and so I actually credit the Department of Juvenile Justice and the leadership at that time for being willing to take that risk. Yes. Yeah. Um, because had they not, you yeah. know, it just would have been same old, same old. Yeah, I mean, it's, it seems, um, I can say this because, and so I, again, whatever if people feel comfortable saying it, and I can say this because they don't work in a prison library, but um, it seems to me just as bad to ban books in a prison library as it is to ban books in any library. But, um, and I'm thinking also on a, just an aside is that um, it would be a great program, another great program to match the incarcerated youth with maybe like the people who work at the prison to discuss literature. The thought, that... Yeah, no, it's, yeah, because what happens is a number of the staff actually, uh, you know, are quietly reading these works on the side because uh -huh. the security staff, they're in the room, they hear, you know, what's all this conversation about Tolstoy, yeah. you know, you know, the, the residents are getting really excited about the death of Ivan Illich. I got to check this work out. And so that's exactly what happens. And then, you know, in, and then on kind of downtime, they'll have conversations with the, you know, the students, the, the residents. That's awesome. That's and the librarians also play a really important role in that. I mean, so I've worked with librarians um, who've also been kind of a conduit between this, the, res the, the correctional center students and the staff. Um, and so, yes, it has become more of a, it's not formally that what right. you just described, but I can totally see why that would work. That's that's wonderful. That's I, I do remember situations like that because we did allow staff to check out books. And so the doctors from the mental health wing or um, the teachers from the vocational side would come and, and browse and check out a novel um, and have conversations with the inmate aides who are working in the library. Again, maybe not a formal book group, but it would be one more point of connection for them to say, oh, hey, you're reading this. I read it last week or I remember reading this. And um, so they would have good conversations. In the well, library. if any of you guys want to um, work on that as a as a concept, you know, reach <laughs> out to me um, because that is something. I mean, I so just so I, I I I've been talking about incarcerated youth, but the but actually we've expanded to the Char Albemarle Charlottesville Regional Jail. The oh. Commonwealth Attorney of Charlottesville reached out to me like two and a half years ago and. Oh have been studying our program and, and after what happened, you know, um, in August, was it 2019, 2017, um, the, you know, the, the Nazis marching mm -hmm. um, in Charlottesville, uh, you know, they realized that they wanted to do something. They wanted to provide opportunities. So anyway, the long and the short is they brought our program. So we are now at the, at the local jail. And that is also a relationship with the, the jail, but also the Commonwealth Attorney of Charlottesville, who provides 
um, who in addition to these the inmates getting academic credit also um, have certain other incentives like a reduction in their sentence and um, um, and so there is a quite a bit of interest in this model of bringing people together through books. Um, so I, yeah, I, I'm sure if I were to talk to him, he would, um, he'd be amenable to that idea. I'd like to get the judges reading with the inmates. Oh, that'd be awesome. With yeah. the security staff, everyone, everyone sitting down together, reading these together. That would, that would be really very, very cool. Um, well, so, so if somebody's asked, a few people have asked questions about, about um, your program, Andy. So I just want to remind everyone, when you registered for the program, you would have gotten a link um, to the movie, which is called Seat to the Table. I highly recommend the movie. It's amazing. Um, and so that will answer a lot of your questions. Um, but, but just for now, someone's asked, um, how often do you meet and how many people are in the groups? So um, we meet for um, 10 or 11 weeks uh, each semester um, for an hour and a half each time. So that basically, you know, is like, um, what, 15 hours? And, and you know, you would think uh, that's not a lot of time, but you saw from the movie the transformation that happened yeah. in like, and, and that for me, that was really striking for me when I saw it in the movie, like, wow, I never really thought about it that way. This is only 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. And we remember what they were like in week one and what they were like in week 10. Um, so they meet for 10 weeks, the UVA students and the correctional center students, um, they sit down. Um, so UVA students always work in pairs usually, um, or sometimes triads, and they sit down with the same group of two or three you know, um, incarcerated youth or adult inmates, as the case may be, and that is their group for the semester. So it's small groups of like five people total, and that is their that's their posse for the semester. And sometimes we do full group stuff, but mostly their their group identity is those small intimate groups. And what we found is that intimacy is really powerful, um, and and it really allows for a, a a quick deepening of the relationships that wouldn't happen if we met as a full group. Um, and so we'll typically have eight or nine uh, pairs. So we'll have 16 to 18 UVA students, and then we'll have um, you know, 20 to 25 uh, correctional center students. And UVA students have to apply to this. So uh, you know, when I first started offering this, when it really started to take off, like in 2011, 2012, I was getting like 90 applications a semester for 16 spots. Um, and now it's not that it's not, you know, it's that's been cut in half. Um, but uh, so there's a real competition at UVA because, you know, the, people know about the course now and, and the opportunity. But also the correctional center students also um, have to apply or they're selected, you know, they're selected by their teachers. So there's certain criteria uh, which that by which they're selected that I don't determine. A lot of it has to do with you know, the judgment of the facility in terms of behavioral appropriateness or academic readiness or, you know, especially because most of my UVA students are women, there's always a concern about people who are in there for sexual offenses and how far along are they in their treatment. So there's a, a number of issues that, um, that they have to consider. We all have to consider, but they make the final call on that. Um, yeah, and, th and each week they read a different work and it's always a short work. Um, a short story or even a poem. Um, we don't read the, you know, Anna Karenina and, and um, although we did read Crime and Punishment um, several summers ago, but that's because we all had two months, uh, okay. a small group of UVA students and a group of the Correctional Center students who really enjoyed the spring semester class actually did an extension program. And we sat down and we read Crime and Punishment over two months wow. um, at Beaumont Juvenile Correctional Center. And that was super powerful. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, that that reminds me, somebody has asked, and Julie, this, um, maybe you could start off by answering this, but then I think it also applies um, to something um, I thought of when I watched the film, Andy, which I kind of understand why, but it, uh, it would be great for you to speak to it. So, um, so I'll start with you, Julie. Um, somebody asked about letters um, and whether when you get a letter from a, a, an incarcerated person, whether you write back, does that create sort of a, a, a pen pal sort of situation? 
That is a great question. Um, we do not develop personal relationships with the prisoners per se. If they ask for a pen pal, we have resources in the community that we can send those letters on to. And that doesn't come up super often, but occasionally it does. We are so busy sending the books out that we, we are not even able to keep um, keep like records or of what we have sent to whom. We just uh, pack those boxes up every week and send them out in the mail. But um, I have gotten to know some of the guys over these six years because they write every month. And I kind of think of them as my guys, <laughs> if you will. Who, um, and I know what they are interested in. I know what kind of books they like. I always try to handle their requests personally because I feel I do feel a connection. And they don't, of course, know me from Adam. They don't know who's on the other end. Although sometimes they say, uh, you know, you who are reading this letter, thank you. You know, you who are providing these books, um, thank you. But um, the ones that I have gotten to know by name and that I'm always um, kind of looking out for, the books I know they want. Today, for example, I was just thrilled to find that one book because I'd been looking for it for weeks for one of my guys, quote unquote. But no, we don't develop those personal relationships so much. I think Kay Allison did that when she was um, running the program from her bookshop. And um, she was doing it in her own way. And I did have a lot of personal connections with the inmates. Um, uh, we, we are operating in a little bit different style and uh, but we we do respond to every letter and if we can't find the books they want or anything that we think is related we send them a postcard okay. we tell them why we ask them to write again um, so we do contact everyone back in some fashion oh, that's... but not personally so much right that's great that's that's um yeah, I'm thinking too, Julie, I'm thinking like, wow, I wonder if we could, it's amazing you're doing all of that with just a bunch of volunteers, like they're, I'm thinking of other ways we could access books, but anyway, that's for another time, um, and then Andy, I noticed in the film that, um, I kind of understand why, but, but maybe you can tell us that the students and the incarcerated youth cannot have contact for five years. Yeah. Um... If you understand why, I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear from you because one of the most frustrating um, aspects of of our work and for the students in particular is there's something called the no contact rule. Um, and I, I don't know if this applies to. I don't think this applies to adult prisons, but with the Department of Juvenile Justice, they many years ago they implemented a policy which said that if you are a volunteer in the correctional center. Um, at the end of your, you know, volunteering, you are not allowed to maintain contact with the youth that you are working with for at least five years. And that even goes theoretically, even if they have been released. Um, and what's so weird about, and so you can imagine from a, from a, from the perspective of the participants in this program, that's a really. Yeah, no, it's awful. Difficult because they know the end is coming and the, and the relationships form and, and, and then just as things really start gelling, that is the end. Um, and Andy Block, who used to be, who was the director of Virginia's Department of Juvenile Justice for several years. Um, uh, so he, he's also a UVA professor. And, you know, he um, told me that because of our program, they were actually revisiting, reviewing oh, really? Okay. this policy um and they were reconsidering it and um and then he left and then it was no longer reconsidered so um and then we have you know and so nobody has i i kind of think i understand why yeah, but yeah. i have not yet heard um really clear compelling explanation of why um the risks of what could happen if you maintain contact, outweigh the benefits mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the correctional center students of maintaining that relationship. Um, and and just to be frank, there even like we had a speaker in my class this past spring, and um, we didn't get an answer that was satisfactory. And I, mm -hmm. I'm I really want to understand it. And again, I have guesses, but you know, so maybe you guys can 
have some insight that I, I don't. Well, I kind of lied because I don't, I mean, I just have the guesses too and the, the assumptions, but like that part of the movie just made me cry when they were leaving. I was like, they're just, that's over. Like their relationship is over. And yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't, I mean, I probably have the same guess as you do, but I, to me, it seems like that should be something that's allowed. Well, so one of the, one of the reasons is, and this, this part makes sense. So they're very protective of incarcerated youth populations because once you're 21, um, you, uh, your involvement in the system is expunged from your record. Okay. Um, and so, and that's very intentional because they want to give you a clean slate and right. opportunity. So you can imagine all the, all the kids that were in the film had to meet with their lawyers. They had to, I mean, they, before they were allowed to be seen on screen, you know, in perpetuity, because people will see this, you know, for 10, oh. 20 years, um, they had to meet with their lawyers and the lawyers had to, you know, advise them. And in almost every case, the lawyer advised them that the benefits of being involved with this and actually being seen to be involved with this are actually going to outweigh the potential yeah. risks. Yeah. Um, so one of the reasons is because, you know, if you were a staff and you worked at the facility and then uh, three years later after one of the residents gets out and they contact you, they knew you in a different context. So that the, the staff member knew you in, um, you know, um, and there, that opens up the possibility of manipulation, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and so, and, and the, anyway, that's one example. And that kind of makes sense to me. Yeah. But that's a staff member. That's not a volunteer. Right. Not a right. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it I mean, what what I was going to guess is a sort of privacy thing, but that's more about books and patrons than it is about relationships. I mean, I'm thinking, for instance, at the library, we can't, sometimes people will come and say, oh, can you tell me what I checked out six months ago? And we have to say, we cannot tell you that because we don't know that because your record is private, but that's different than I'm guessing it's like a, a it's like a thing of safety and they're afraid that I don't know. Well, I guess I can give you another specific example, which will, um, when I shared this with my current UVA student class, that it really hit them hard. So there was an escape three years ago, or two years ago, from Beaumont Juvenile Correctional Center. It was very, Bonnier rather, it was public. It was uh, someone on the outside. Um, uh, one of the residents had communicated with someone on the outside, um, but also had an in internally one of the guards helped them escape um and they provided them with uh you know the cutting materials and they cut the fence and and they almost killed a guard as part of this escape and so uh they contacted me immediately when this happened because they hadn't found them and one of the young men who had escaped was in our program and so i had to make a split second decision of like well wait um so I had to let all of all of my students from that semester know that, look, this happened. You need to understand that if so-and-so reaches out to you, mm -hmm. um, do not respond. So that's a really extreme example of where, you know, that kind of thing can happen. But that but that's really extreme. That's really extreme. Yeah. Have any of you, um, we should, well, let me see if we have any questions. I realize, whoa, it's, we're running out of time here, but let me, uh, let me quickly see if there's any questions. I was just going to ask if anyone wanted to um, share any, um, any other stories or um, talk about whether you've kept in touch, maybe Beth or, or any, anybody, maybe Meredith, with any of the incarcerated people that you've helped at the library. So um, we have also a do not contact for 180 days. And it's also like if you are on probation, it's 180 days from once you're off of paper, they call it, that you're no longer in probation. So I have had um, some of my actual library assistants, my workers, to go home. Um, 
but I don't think any of them are outside of that window mm -hmm. of that 180 days off of paper. Um, I hear, you know, I hear stories somehow sometimes of how different ones are doing. Um, I haven't, I haven't heard of any of my ladies actually getting a job in the library, which makes me sad because I think that it would be wonderful if they did such a wonderful job when they worked in the prison library. Um, but I can't even like, I can't even write them a letter of recommendation to say, this is what they did. They did a great job. Please hire them. I can't do that. And so I don't know, that would be helpful if I could do that. I can't, I can't even do like a verification of employment. Like this is where they work. This is how long they worked. And these are the duties that they had. So it's kind of hard, but yeah, that's no, I haven't. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. that must be hard. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they are all opening library cards right when they get out. Well, I do. I tell, you know, um, this is when we, we still were in person and we would have quite a number of ladies that would want to come over to use the computers to type up a resume or something like that. And a lot of them were wanting a job application for a certain place that they thought they might try to apply. And I'm like, you don't understand. Nobody fills out paper applications anymore. You, I can't find an application to print you off for whatever place that you wanted to work. So I'm like, you, time you get out, the first thing you need to do is go to the public library and go, the librarian will help you to set up a Gmail and then yeah. they will help you and to fill out the application. So I, I usually always give them that advice to head to the public library is one of their first places. Oh, so that's great. I, hope, I hope they listen. <laughs> Well, do, do you think, do you think, I mean, just, we're just going to wrap it up pretty, so this is a kind of big question for the end of the session, but um, do you think on some level, like we've talked about how there's such a commonality um, when we all read books together, but do you think there's in some sense, um, some books that might resonate more with um, people who are incarcerated than, um, than, than not? I, I mean, I tried to, I tried to read the man's search for meaning just because they all talk and talk about that. And I was like, it, I don't know. I didn't have the same feel like people would say it changed their lives, but I didn't, I guess it didn't resonate with me the same way be, that it does with them. I don't know, but I'm sure that there are books like that, that will speak to them just because they will relate to it differently. So Oh, and the, um, oh gosh, I, the book just went right out my head. It was the book that was stayed on the bestseller list forever and ever and ever. The Crawdad book. Oh, oh my where God. the Crawdads sing, yeah. They love that book. Still to this day, they love, <laughs> love, love, love that book. And I guess I kind of see some of the reasons why they really, the book resonated with them. But I, you know, I liked it too, but they really loved that book. That's interesting. I mean, well, one, one thing that made me think of that is um, I was talking to somebody who does teach in um, in a prison and um, they were all reading the Odyssey together. And that really resonated with the incarcerated people um, that were in that class, um, obviously wanting to go home. You know, this person was telling me that that was teaching in this class that um, the first, the first, after the first night, um, they all said, well, you know, have a, have a good night, have a good drive home professor. Um, and he realized like, I can't tell them like, have a good drive home. Like they're not going home. And so that was when he realized we're studying the odyssey and that no wonder that resonates with them. They, they want to go home, you know? So. Well, I put up bulletin boards and things in the library and try to make it festive for the holidays and the seasons. And we were doing a big bulletin board and had beach reads on it with some book jackets. And I just, I don't know, I felt weird like putting up a bulletin board like that when I know that for many of them, they won't ever see a beach again. And I kind of said that to one of my library workers and she says, but you don't understand, Ms. Gentry, we still go to the beach in our minds. This, you know, that's what books do for us. We're here, but our minds are not here. And, and that just really made me think, you know, that's exactly 
the mm -hmm. most important thing that we're doing for people is we're allowing them to go someplace else in their minds. So, yeah. I think that's a beautiful, I, I was gonna say something, but I actually don't wanna follow that. I think that's a beautiful message to leave us with. Yeah. I, I agree, I agree, <laughs> lovely. Well, thank you to all of you for participating in this important discussion. And I think um, I think the more people know about, um, I mean, there's something maybe about incarcerated people that literally they're just locked away and we don't think about them. And the more maybe people know about, um, about books in prisons, the better. I mean, I, so, so I really want to thank you all for, for um, getting the word out about that. Thank you for Thank doing you, this. Man. Oh, it was my pleasure. Um, let us see what there might be another. No, we've just got a lot of people saying thank you. So <laughs> um, thanks again. And I hope you all have a good night and that you don't lose power. Thank you, Julie, <laughs> for joining by phone. It was my pleasure. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye.